guys will get started. Uh, I'm very pleased today to introduce Mark Stringer. Uh, at Santa Barbara, uh, workshop on uh, Galaxy Information and Feedback. Mark got his uh, PhD, I was just asking him that uh, between Austin and Caltech with Joe Silk as his advisor, and I imagine Andrew Benson providing all the actual hands on. Help. Pretty much. Um, yeah, more or less. Okay, yeah. good. All right, so tonight, today he's going to tell us about, uh, as I said, seeking signatures of cosmology and galaxy properties. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, quite a long way from home for me. Um, I should add, actually, this is a photo of Tenerife uh, taken from one of the coasts. I'll, I've got a few more in there just to add a bit more context uh, later on. Um, so the institute I work at now is right down here uh, and it has a few things in common with Canada, it has a colonial history so this is actually where Columbus stopped before trying to get to India and failing and uh, yeah it's also I discovered recently um, where this guy lost his arm so it is now currently part of Spain um, but not for want of trying by the British uh, so they had a go at making the Canarians British. Um, and and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the closest they've got is in the advent of tourism in the 1960s, the British colonized the southern desert, which the Spanish quite sensibly hadn't bothered to colonize. Um, so uh, the, Sp the Spanish live in the northern part of the island, and uh, tourism is left for the, for the southern part, which is great because it keeps the skies clear up by the observatory, which I'll show you in a second. So it's incredibly far south. I'm constantly struck at how far south Canada is. So it's right down in the south of France, glorious, and it's easy to believe today. We're the same latitude as Canada. Exactly. And both of you have a film festival. <laughs> and I believe we're in the middle of one. Is that right? Yes, we are. Yeah, it's great timing. Um, and uh, conversely, I'm constantly horrified at how far north my country is. So I, I willingly accepted a, my first postdoc in Durham uh, with Carlos Frank, as Norm said, but then was horrified when I arrived, having spent five years in California, to be reminded how dark it gets there in the winter. Um, so it's really quite phenomenal. It's right up there in the north of Canada. Obviously, the Gulf Stream prevents us from actually freezing solid, unlike Canada, but it's, uh, it's still pretty grim up there. I fell asleep under my desk on my first day as a postdoc in Durham. No such problem now. Uh, it's very bright, very hot. So it's actually great to be uh, in a more northern country at the moment. And we just survived an enormous conference. The whole of Europe descended very enthusiastically on these islands for the European Week of Space Science, the equivalent of the IAU, IAU I guess, that was in Hawaii. Um, so both conferences were on islands this year. Um, but uh, we were worried it wasn't going to work. And 1,200 people, it's amazing how... 1,200 people can be dispersed on such an entertaining place as Tenerife. So this is a, a zoom in on the area for those who aren't familiar. A lot of people are confused as to which uh, institute is which. This is where I work and where almost everybody works on a day-to-day -day basis. All the theorists, um, instrumentation, engineers are all based here. But one of the more famous uh, institute, one of the more famous telescopes they're over here on La Palma, which is even darker, even more isolated, as you can imagine. Um, so the view from the roof of our building, so the, the Institute's just here, and that's actually the next island, that's Gran Canaria over there. So you get a sense of how high up everything is. Um, but if you go over to the actual observatory uh, on La Palma, it's that much higher still, and you're right up here above the clouds. And this is actually a view of Canada from La Palma. So Canada's over here somewhere, and this is the last point of uh, land in the Canary Islands. That's El Hierro. So just a sense of scale, just while we're playing this game, it's quite interesting how small this area is by North American standards. So the whole of the islands chain would sort of fit in this area of Lower Ontario, Northern New York. So if you imagine that that just being ocean and instead of some other country, um, which we've not heard of, or either the side of the lake there, then there'd be Grand Canaria 
uh, the next island. And meanwhile, as you head down towards Hamilton, instead of it just being completely flat, there's an enormous volcano. So the Canary Islands are all about the Z direction. So Tierra is up at, uh, that's 12,000 feet. So if you look from, a t this photo taken from near the institute gives you a sense of how high everything is. There's the volcano. And this, in fact, this entire plateau is above the height of Ontario. So, um, uh, and yes, this is the, the view around the side. So it would also be under here, in fact. So back to uh, La Palma, I think, is actually a bit lower because um, Tede is the highest point of Spain. Um, but it's up there, comparable. I think it's 2.9 something off the top of my head, but I'd have to check. Good question. Um, so the human beings there, um, coming to them, this is the Galaxy Theory Group, so I'm a third of it. Uh, it's a mainly observational institute, as you can imagine, and this is a drive um, by the institute and uh, with funding, uh, which is uh, from Spain, to sort of internationalize the institute, if you like. And we have here an Italian, a Spaniard, and an Englishman. Uh, and this is a photo of us inside the Tede supercomputer. Um, as soon as we took, we took this photo because we're using this computer to run simulations, and then it immediately reminded me, um, sort of in a slightly sinister way, of this shot from the movie. And I started wondering, you know, <laughs> what we're becoming as astro astrophysicists. And I think most of the people in the Institute think of us as these guys, you know. But we're trying to change that image. Uh, so this is a paper we put together. It was a bit of a dilemma what to try and talk about today because I think any number of subjects could have been interesting. But I just thought I'd go with the most recent thing which we've thrown together here uh, using the Bolshoi simulation to try and attack quite a hot topic observationally which is the origin of compact massive galaxies. Before I get to that, to explaining that though, I kinda, it's appropriate to take a step back and just review some work it actually did at the Observatoire in Paris um, about galaxy size trends. And, and what we wanted to do with this project was a bit more general than the more recent one and just explore whether we can make a connection between the cosmic expansion basic cosmology and uh, the galaxy size trends which were starting to appear from surveys. Because uh, we found increasingly in the literature the observational papers were wanting to make this connection um, from their side and we wanted to come at it from the cosmological perspective and see if we could meet them in the middle. So the first thing we did was sort of switch the computers off and have a think about it. I don't know, is it worth, is it easy enough to just do this? Yes. So if you go right back to very basic cosmology and you ask about how the size of collapsed regions evolve with redshift, then what the observers will be wanting sooner or later is a mass size diagram. So if you make it logarithmic here, and this could be R in whatever units you want, just putting, putting them on here for completeness. So if you can get the density, if you know what the density of collapsed regions is, you immediately have loci on, the, on these axes. So the equation you would appeal to can be written very simply. So you're just interested in a density. And actually, from cause, if you're just interested in the density of any piece of universe, a large enough piece of universe, then this is the sort of reassuringly simple expression here, where this is the Hubble parameter, and it is a function of redshift. So this evolves. Now, if you just want to know the density of collapsed regions, then again, rather conveniently, it's possible to just substitute here for the overdensity, the final overdensity. Now, this number is quite, is in the simplest possible spherically symmetric scenario, is 18 pi squared. Now, I went to a conference last year, which Norm was also at actually, and um, led by Andre Kraftstoff, who's done a lot of work on trying to uh, motivate and understand what overdensity you actually end up with in a real universe. Um, led by him, we discussed this for a day. And the conclusion was that it's pretty close to 18 pi squared. <laughs> um, it, it, in all the simulations and theoretical work, 
uh, looking at the first caustic radius of collapsing regions. So it's where something's come in and it's its first turnaround point, obviously in 3D and with diffuse accretion. It's not quite so straightforward to find this, but they did do so and they said that 200 is very close to the answer that you get if you do all that analysis. So this gives you, um, actually I should write radius here so that it's easier to see. So this gives you a, an immediate connection between the radius and the mass of these collapsed regions, which is actually scale invariant at the level that we're writing here. So it comes out at pretty close to, I should write the, probably the, fo the formal version here. So you get this. And then this bottom, is very, bottom half is very close to 1 plus z, depending on which phase you're in, of course, and the exact cosmology. Um, but a lot of the observers have been trying to track radial evolution uh, as being um, some 1 plus z to some power. And you can pull that out of here to first order or second order, depending on how precise you want to be. So what this gives you is gently sloping loci here in this plane, um, which are evolving with time upwards as the universe expands. So this, that this is approximately a constant to the satisfaction of uh, very theoretically minded people uh, tells you that the evolution of this is going to be relatively straightforward. Now, if you add into this a sense of what size regions are collapsing at each time, then you, you get the evolution in this direction as well. So if we now just count um, yeah, so let's just have n uh, for the moment. So this is really dn by dm dn by d log m. I'm going to cut corners there because I haven't given myself much space. And this is the same x-axis. Sorry. Uh, then the mass function is going to evolve, but mostly at the high mass end. So if this is high redshift, early times, then regions of this mass here just simply haven't had time to expand and then recollapse in on, on themselves. Now, so I think the room's full of cosmologists, so I should probably stop there. What this means, coming back to the structure population, is that you'd expect evolution from both upwards and to high mass. And then there's a, the, probably the first order effect on top of that is that the true trend will actually steepen with time. Because the, here you have not only structures collapsing now, but structures collapsing from the past. And as I say to less technical audiences, at redshift zero, there's just much more past to choose from. So you have a lot of structures down here which will steepen this trend as you go up. Conversely, there are no structures from the future to make it symmetric. Um, so that's just an introduction. Um, to some more numerical work, for which I'll need the screen again. Lucky I'm tall. Go on, go on. So uh, for this, for this uh, first paper, we picked up for the Millennium Simulation, which was publicly available by this point. Um, and we actually tracked, we actually tried to assess it against these basic principles. So here's the figure that we produced where you can zoom in on that. And this is the redshift, all the structures in the simulation at redshift 2. Um, and this is just to guide the eye. Now, the, trouble, the, only, the slight catch here, which some people will probably pick up on very quickly if I don't mention it, is that um, if you, your, how you define your structure is defined by the delta that you choose. So in order to assess the growth, you need to pick something uh, more general. So we, we looked at the half mass radius. So it is somewhat user defined, but not so much as to mean that you are not learning anything from the numerical simulation that you've run. 
So I should emphasize that these are just, this is just gravity only n body simulation. Um, I've just highlighted the 10 most massive structures here. Uh, so when we zoom forward, we do indeed see the mass size relation steepening, just according to that uh, correction that we mentioned just now. And I guess what you can start doing, which you can't do on the blackboard, is actually ask what happens to these guys. And so they're connected to their descendants at, at redshift zero by these lines, and, and one of them's actually gone backwards. So it's lost mass and got smaller. Come to back to that in a second. So here's just to back up my sketch on the blackboard, here's a mass function. And uh, certainly to, not to people here, but to observers often, you know, it's, you can't emphasize enough what a, what a big difference this is. So all these cluster size objects just were not there in the past. Um, and it's just worth constantly reminding ourselves of that, I think. What can be quite fun is, is looking at the, the sort of fate of these ones. Because a lot of observers particularly try and assume preservation of mass order as they compare surveys at different redshifts. And you can just say, well, what, how, how does this go just with dark matter only, not even including the com complexities? So the most massive guy at Redshift 2 actually holds his position at the front. The next three do not do very well. So they get scattered amongst the sort of top 200. And then the other effect, which uh, is important, when we, track, when we trace, tracked the fifth most massive per guy, it came up as the top. So th these two merge. And then this one is the one that went backwards. And that actually became a substructure of a larger region. Um, so it's, in fact, I believe, a substructure of one. And that will become quite relevant towards the end of the talk when we come to talk about compact structures. So as far as, as far as using mass order as a way of connecting high and low redshift systems, at the basic level of this, it doesn't do very well. So there's a little warning sign there, which we picked up on the way. Now, of course, the paper's got galaxies in the title, and that's, so has my seminar. So what you need to do now is somehow use what we know about this, both from theory and numerical work, to this, which is the Sloan data on mass size radius for galaxies. So these straight lines have got warped. And what we wanted to do in the paper is try to provide a um, basic theoretical outline of how that happens, uh, which is, of course, thousands of papers in its own right. But by, if we can make connections here, then it's going to enable us to, to link these two. Um, so I can talk about that a bit on the board before I go on. Uh, do I keep this equation? That's the question. Rubber. Uh, yeah, I think we can use that for the moment. So a big, um, a big technique for trying to match the masses of the observed galaxies with the masses of the structures in the end body simulation um, obviously, you can try and do it with a hydro simulation, but in order to have the volumes that we need to make this comparison, that's still not currently possible. And it certainly wasn't at the time of writing. So just to review the technique for those who work on other fields, what you can do is use this one way. So you just count. So you have your equivalent mass function for galaxies. So this would now be stellar mass. And you assume that um, the most, broadly speaking, you can work, have a working assumption that the most massive galaxy is hosted by the most massive structure and build up. What you do as you do this is you build up a mass here and a mass here, and then you can relate them. Uh, so if this is now the virial mass of the collapsed region, and then up here, you have the stellar mass. Um, 
then you get you build up slowly by matching these together. You build up points on the picture. And actually, as they do this, what they find is a relation along the li these lines. I've sketched quite badly. You'll see the official version in a minute. This line I've shown here would just be the cosmic, the total mass available from standard cosmology. And it's well known that these two don't line up. No one expects them to. Uh, but the form here that you get from this approach uh, has this form. So this is called abundance matching. Uh, and it's worth adding quickly that, of course, this is a very basic description of how you do it. But it is the spirit behind it. And now, to do it properly, you use a differential form um, and let the computer try and work out what formula. And then, actually, what happens, which is quite interesting, is that they, if you want to, people build in additional, additional uh, components to it. So you go from the version I sketched would just be m star as a function of the virial mass. But then, what you can do is just keep um, adding stuff in here. So the host, the host cluster mass, the number of satellites, and just keep going. And that's indeed what people are working on in this field. So speaking of people working in this field, let's go back to the actual results. And not my uh, bad drawings. Ah, oh, come on. Yes. So this is one of the earliest um, paper using this technique from recent literature. So this is ben, a guy called Ben Moster. I should add immediately there's a guy called Peter Beruzzi, who does very similar work. And the two, the, the, I'd say they're complementary uh, projects. And this is the relation he derived uh, along the lines of what I sketched on the board. And this is the same thing, just on my axes now. Um, there's a mathematical form here, which is actually quite constraining. Um, and more recent work, I think, drops this. It generalizes it. But it's very computational, computationally demanding, especially as survey volumes grow as well. And you're trying to match data sets. What you can also do is try and have a crack at connecting this mass scale to a characteristic velocity of the galaxy or the galaxy group. This is a bit tenuous. People will argue for a long time, quite rightly, about whether you can make that connection. But to the extent that one can do so, um, you find that these two, com these two uh, routes to this connection are, are consistent to some degree, to some level. So here you've got satellite, Milky Way satellite galaxies. Uh, this is the Tully-Fisher relation, um, or a, a, a version of it on these axes. And then up here are the bright central galaxies of clusters. So for the, for the, the sort of zeroth order, then you, you have sort of three phases in this plane, which do actually correspond to different physical limits. I always think uh, there's, a, so there's a natural hierarchy. And it always reminds me of the sort of academic hierarchy, which I saw as I walked in here. So I couldn't resist taking a photo of this. You know, so what you've got here are, are the sort of institutes. And they have their brightest central galaxies you know, the faculty. And then here you've got a sort of one-to-one -one relationship, uh, which I think is sort of like the postdoc phase. You know, the more work you put in, the more papers you get out, you're more or less independent. You might have a few other small systems around you, but it's not like a cluster where you're one of many. And then down here are the, graduate, uh, the sort of graduate students where their fate is very much determined by which group they happen to be in and what's happening in the bigger systems around them. I certainly still feel a bit like that, to be honest. Um, so there's this sort of natural, <laughs> natural arrangement here. I don't think the analogy is completely futile. So what's happening, particularly at the top here in this limit, I don't know about the academic analogy, but in reality, is that um, although your collapsed total collapse region is getting bigger and bigger, uh, as with this math function, which I tried to sketch, that doesn't mean that you get a corresponding galaxy in the middle. Because the galaxies pre-existed it, they collapsed much earlier. So the system's already fragmented into modern parts. So I guess the analogy works. I mean, if you keep getting bigger and bigger institutes, 400, 500, 600, that doesn't mean that you're going to get um, 
one person producing all the papers from that. So, there's, so the paper, we try to motivate this argument, um, but with a, quite a bit more physics to it. Um, so here's the, sort of, here's the sketch diagram that we, that we, that we put in there. Uh, so the physical limit up here is fragmentation, so that material, um, the material here, which is available, hasn't cooled. This is well known in the literature. There would be a whole easy to do seminar after seminar just on each of these problems. Um, this region in the center, actually, I, I do often do whole hour seminars on. Um, and this, this is connected to supernovae, uh, which keep the material, eject the material which might have ended up in the middle. I should add in passing um, that obviously uh, black hole feedback is a big, has a big uh, role up here. But when you run models, um, you find that it's, not, it, it's a second order effect to the cooling. So it's, it is essential to fit the data, but it's not the first reason that, that there is this disparity. And then here is actually the fringe of galaxy formation. So you're coming up against a hard cooling limit, which is actually, uh, which is exacerbated by reionizing radiation. So the reason we put the sketch together was just to try to make the point that the, the relation we had that we've got in the, this basic uh, constant density relation which you get from the cosmology means that if you know the mass scale of your collapsed region, then you get the radius of it for free so if you flip this picture around, you, you have both a mass scale and a radial scale here. Um, so if you think you understand the stellar mass, host mass relationship, then you get a mass size relation for free. Now, in this case, what you're connecting here is a stellar mass to, um, stellar mass to host radial scale. And your previous mass limit becomes this flat radius relation. So the straight lines we had here get warped by these physical limits, if this is correct. Um, so the sort of last piece of the puzzle that we cited in this paper in, in order to make this point was, uh, again, by Andre, who use the abundance matching not to investigate the masses, but to investigate radial scales. Um, so he found, using the same technique, that the evidence was in favor of a direct correlation between the mass of the total collapsed region, uh, the size of the total collapsed region, and the half light radius of the galaxy. So as you can see, there's a lot of scatter here. Uh, would require, again, a whole seminar on this would be easy to come up with. But this does actually follow on from lots of theoretical work from as much as 30, 40, 50 years ago, which claimed that this should happen due to angular momentum conservation. So it's applying modern survey data to reconfirm or to reassure uh, the theoretical, the preceding theoretical ground. So it's, it was a short paper for that reason. Um, now, the take on this is that, is that if that's right, then these physical limits that you get from studying the masses does help you perhaps understand uh, the, the way that the data maps out on this plane. So these um, progressive lines uh, that I've sketched over there on the mass radius relation for structures can be seen Maybe, maybe it's the case that we are seeing echoes of that in the galaxies. So these are physical limits here, not, not means. So we're not expecting this line to match here. What they're showing is just the, phys where the physical limits that are uh, preventing galaxies existing here, say, or here, or here. But the, the lower mass systems um, fall below here on earlier collapse redshifts, if this argument ha has, any, has any ground whereas later systems fall above the collapsed redshift at later times. So we also just tried to trace this as a function of redshift. So Mark Hurta's company does Cosmo, uh, was running the Cosmos survey. And uh, so now we've got time running along the x-axis, and we're looking at galaxy radial scales from the whole survey. 
And it's way too early to analyze this, I think, but people in the literature were doing so. And they were looking at arbitrary powers of 1 plus z. We wanted to just test it against this um, idea. So we're looking at, at it as a function of the Hubble parameter. And we've, uh, here are, we've divided the sample here for ob reasons of observational consistency with what other people were doing uh, into disks and ellipticals. And interestingly, they don't evolve particularly differently, the two, the two samples. And they both evolve broadly in keeping with this. But I don't think there's enough, enough uh, at the time of writing, there wasn't enough information to start doing statistical analysis. And this is intermediate mass. Over here, you have very, you have very high mass, and it's certainly there's not enough to go on here. But it's the, the beginning of investigating it more quantitatively. How am I doing for time? Yeah, OK. So I've managed to arrive at the more recent paper, which is a bit more specific, so I won't have to wave my hands quite so much, I hope. Uh, and uh, I've mentioned already that we, we now use Bolshoi simulation data, which is an n-body simulation from more recent times. Uh, and this was uh, this is a Baruzzi uh, first author, and he designed the halo finder, which is generally recognized to be uh, to be better at representing the collapsed regions than, than previous ones. Um, now, what we do here is take this same plane, but look instead at the most compact objects that are coming up in the M-body simulation by way of making an analogy with the most compact galaxies, which may well be paired with them. Um, so this is uh, for the concentration of 20, which is quite a stringent limit. And we're, we're interested just in the ones that could host galaxies of the size of NGC 1277, which you might have just seen there in the abstract, which is a very topical system, um, in part because of the black hole, but also because of its compactness. It lies way off the average mass size relation for galaxies. So we're interested in structures that lie way off the mass size relation for structures. And these represent the most compact 1% in this uh, mass bin. So or one in 100, they're 1 in 100 occurrences. Now, what we've done here, what you can do in the simulation, which is great, is just ask where they are. And the answer is that they're almost all satellites of larger regions. So here in purple are colored their hosts, um, which are right up here and are, on the whole, unremarkable themselves. And the reason that these systems become remarkable is because they become uh, satellites of those regions. So if you go to the mass function, you can, you can see where these structures are found um, in the context of the other systems. Now, one of the simplest things that comes out of this, but was the most, one of the more interesting uh, um, results for the obs observers who we wrote the paper with, was just the simple fact that this means your, the probability of finding these extreme objects, which is represented by this fraction here, is going up as you go from low mass to high mass. So if you're an observer trying to find these, you have there's a much better chance of finding them in a massive cluster than in a smaller group, according um, as far as the structure formation theory is, is telling us uh, in any rate. Now, the other game, which is very easy to play with simulations, as we did before, um, which can be quite instructive, is to just take this picture, which is redshift zero. So in this paper, we're interested in local compacts, uh, and just ask where, those, where the progenitors of those systems were at redshift two, 10 gig years ago. And if you ask that question, then the answer is that they, lang they lie smack bang in the middle of the mass size relation at that point. And they're all perfectly um, intermediate mass uh, normal structures. And what makes them remarkable is that they go, they become part of a larger region. And the cosmic evolution, which we were sketching on the boards, is frozen out. So they're, they're relics of the Redshift 2 universe that exist still at Redshift 0. And they stripped as Exactly. Um, and, uh, the word relics popped up, 
which I quite like. Um, and this is a paper that um, will be coming out very soon. Um, it's just being, uh, I believe it's in the process of, of being published now. Uh, I'm a, not the lead author here. It's an actually this is a primarily observational paper in which we're involved. Uh, and uh, the, along with the word relic, which I like, is the word nugget, which I don't like at all. But this is focusing on compact at high redshift rather than low and trying to understand what, what will, where are they now. Um, and we're following that. It's very easy to follow that up theoretically with uh, this, um, this simple exercise, which we've done for Ignacio. Um, and what you can do here is start at redshift 2 and just look at the, the uh, one sigma and above, uh, so the bottom half of this relation, and just ask where, where would you find these guys. So these, in terms of number densities and in terms of fraction of the population, what we have here is an analogous sample to the high redshift. So it's, it's very, you can do it very simply uh, just by assuming that the sizes do go together to some extent, uh, perhaps not monotonically, but that they are related to each other. And then by matching the number densities of the observational survey and in the simulation, then you, you, can, uh, you can attack it quite quickly. So if you zoom forward to redshift zero and ask where these guys are, then they are mostly still very compact, but are scattered very widely through the simulation. So these two lines here are the means at redshift zero and redshift two, and you can see that steepening we were talking about. And what's, what's remarkable down here, uh, there's a lot going on in the plot, so I apologize for that. But I, if you just look at it one line at a time, this dark blue line is everything that was above this mass limit at redshift two. And if you follow that to redshift zero, it, it is a minority population. So if you're looking at a structure locally, which is above some mass limit um, in this range, then it only has a one in five chance that it came from something in that mass range at redshift two. And again, this is a simple, a simple result from basic theory, which I think it is important to, for the observational community to think in these terms. Now, if you're then interested in what fraction came from a co uh, the more compact uh, system there, then you've dropped down even more to 8%. And if you're interested in the ones that haven't been completely destroyed by a major merger, you're down to 5 So the question of where are they now is sort of they're not here very much. <laughs> the majority of systems we're seeing now are, are not descendants of these. Um, so it is a very much, although they represent almost half of the massive, the visible, uh, massive and hence visible structures at Redshift 2, they're, they're a tiny minority now, which makes it very hard to trace them. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do now with Ignacio is to follow this up with stellar populations and see if these two actually hold together to when you push them, the argument holds together when you push it to that, to that level of detail. Uh, but the previous paper um, on the local compacts is already out, has been for quite some time. Um, so I'd be delighted to answer any questions on that. And indeed, um, on this paper, which, which precedes all of them, uh, which was about that part of the mass relation, and this was one that was done at Durham and Paris in conjunction with these other authors, some of whom you may know. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm just high time for some questions if there are any. So uh, thanks very much. So if you, from here, you're, you're taking two limits. You're, you're taking, sorry if I'm coming at the question slowly, but just to make sure I've managed to explain myself successfully. So you're taking the most massive 
um, n. So it's by volume, but you're counting, you're counting from here um, until you've got the right number density. And then you're saying, right, I want the most compact um, n or third of those. And if you track what happens to them, then that red line and this red line represent the same systems. But of those, only about half have evaded a major merger. So at, at most, about half, you would expect to be able to have evolved with um, and look similar to, uh, to, they did, to as they did at Redshift 2. I don't know if that comes anywhere near to answering your question. Well, I think that if there had been one, then you, it would cert then you wouldn't. Oh, I see. In the systems, so if you, um, so what? Yeah, that's a great question. So I should, uh, yeah, it, it would be easy to do that. I should divide this um, by the same color and look at whether ones that have experienced a major merger end up in the mass size plane. So yeah, I should, I could, uh, I should do that. It is indeed, yeah. Uh, but some of these do manage to do it. But as I guess, I guess there's a general there's a general trend to move in this direction. So as material is just accreted, whether by if you're the most compact of the two components, then generally you'll stay compact, and the other guy will spread around the outside. Yeah. So that will increase your half life radius, which is what you're using, I guess. You're using a scale radius, which is I guess half mass. Yeah, yeah. It's this is actually you're right. Yeah, this is the um, the scale NF, of an NFW fit is the scale radius right. of that profile. So it's similar. Yeah. They're close. So they're, so they're growing, essentially, once they've merged. Well, you haven't actually checked. No, no, on this, on this figure, I don't have that. It, I will have it, though. I'd be happy to. I, it's a good reminder to produce it. So we've ended up on the slide, which is, in the, which is the work in progress, which is often where you end up at the seminars. Um, Okay, so but, yeah, actually, but yeah, I could follow these subpopulations on this on this plot as well. I think probably it was taken off to avoid overcrowding the plot, but I could re I, I could uh, go back in it and find it. Yeah. Uh, it's still hard to go back to compare them to the observations, right? Because it's a lot. It's a long road. Yeah. Uh, but the number dense. The, but these basic. You'd be. I, I was surprised myself at how useful these basic numbers are that we're getting from numerical simulations are for for observers in terms of matching, uh, actually assessing theories. Um, because it's, uh, the, two ar the, the argument that they're fighting here is that these, um, these systems from high redshift have survived till now, and are a lot of them, and a lot of them will be the bulges of present day disks. And there's a whole team of people who oppose that and say, no, you can't possibly. Uh, because once an elliptical, always an elliptical. Um, and they're trying to, f so these two arguments are set off against each other in the literature, um, uh, often without the context of these basic statistics, which helps assess them against each other. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just provide a, a little bit of support um, to the arguments in that sense. So I'm personally surprised that there's opposition to the idea that high redshift compacts could survive as bulges. Um, but once you try and assess the stellar populations of high redshift compacts against uh, disk galaxies now, you get into a lot of trouble uh, with conventions and classification of systems. And trying to make sure you're comparing like with like in terms of number densities is also extremely difficult. Um, so the sample gets cut and cut on all sides. Uh, until, it, until you're in trouble. So at the level that the observational comparison is going, this is still useful despite its uh, generality. Just to give you a sense for what kind of percentages you'd expect from basic arguments. I, I would think that uh, counting or taking track of black holes and massive black holes is expanded that one can provide some additional redundancy breaking. I think that's a great idea. They, They aren't going anywhere, right? No, exactly. Yeah, you can. Yeah, they can collide, but they're not going to um, be completely dissipated as right. so, as some galaxies might. But 
Yeah, no, I think that's because I guess what we're trying to do here is dealing, dealing with it in quite binary terms. Um, so the, the structure formation equivalent of a disk galaxy is this category, right? So it's a structure that hasn't had a major merger since Redshift 2. So you've got a fighting chance of forming a disk. So that's the basic level of comparison here which we're citing. These are quite massive uh, halos too, right? Yeah, they're, they're pretty big, yeah. There aren't any, there are almost no looking, sorry, spirals in the Well, th so that will be cited um, alongside, uh, that will definitely be cited by the opponents to the idea of which there are many. Um, but if your, best, if your best hope is 5%, then you might be okay. So I, I think, um, I don't know if, I, if uh, so in fact, the strong version might be that actually, yeah, you need a high reg of compact to form a disk around it to stabilize it. I don't think that's, I don't think that's true from, uh, uh, but it is a, it's the strong, by, by putting that as the strong version of the argument, you can see why the weaker version of the argument might be good. Um, it's, it's that they're actually promoting disk formation um, by their existence because they stabilize that concentrated mass at the center stabilizes the outer regions. Well, I guess the opponents would argue that mapping the halo couldn't have to be too long to be more of a gas field. Yeah, so that's right. So, so what, what we'd like to do, um, I guess what I'd like to do is, is just not, not go too far and, and waste computer time on the problem but at least follow these guys in the numerical simulation and look at the cooling time. Uh, and then you can put another, ca another caveat on here that you need no major merger and feasible cooling times in order to form a disk around them. And then I'd sort of be happy there, but why not run some tailored hydro simulations in parallel uh, and check it from that point of view as well. Um, but they would have to be, t not isolated, but they'd have to be very small volume. Cosmological zoom. So that's actually what we're doing. So you asked about Yope earlier. So that's that's on the table to do. So it's nice, reassuring that you asked that. It is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I think there is the. Um, I think it's pretty good at this mass scale. If you're tracking, at, at, if you were tracking on along the near the y-axis here, I th that's why the y-axis is there. <laughs> it's because left of that, you're, you're going to struggle. You're, you begin to worry about the technique. But I, I, as as far as I, as far as I know, I'm aware from conversations with the author of the code. I think that tracking. Um, most massive progenitors at this mass end is okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, frustratingly for the systems we've, yeah, we've, we've looked at the, um, we've looked at the fits uh, and there are anomalies actually. So uh, in terms of the, the profile, density profile of the halos that you end up with, um, there are anomalies, but there are very few, like one in a thousand are significantly differing from what you would expect from, um, so, uh, and even better, we're only interested, uh, here it's a third, but they're a very high mass. Before we were interested in 1%, but all of those are not the problem, actually. The problem is up here. Uh, I'm digressing from your question, actually, sorry. But um, you can see here, this is a limit where the NFW scale length is equal to the virial radius. And because the halo finder doesn't impose an NFW profile, but it does use it to help decide whether there's whether, whether what's there is a halo. And so as you approach that point, it breaks. But although this is shaded in, the actual number density here is very, very low. So it hasn't conveniently, such flaws as you're rightly or rightly concerned about doesn't affect this project. But um, you're right to be aware of it. Okay, there's no other questions at the State Department. Thanks very much.